has uh, has the mail opened up, Colin, for business? Are you guys pseudo back to normal or not yeah, quite yet? Know, we've we've uh, we had a six week elective surgery pause and really uh, everything shut down except for acute care. Yeah, back in April and May, right. we've pretty much been full steam without pause ever since. Yeah. Minnesota was fortunate. We did not have the uh, the sort of surge wave that, yeah. for example, New York had. Yeah. Uh, it's been more steady and manageable. Um, and I think we benefited from that. Um, but I think everyone's sort of watching nervously uh, what's happening in other parts of the world. I, I know, you know, you guys yeah. are dealing with with a lot. Michigan in the United States is dealing with a surge. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the United States is the United States. I, I think <laughs> the, the vaccine rollout, the acceptance, the infrastructure, I mean, just so many messy pieces that uh, they're, they're just, yeah. you know, we, we should have and could have done so much Hello. better. And, Hello. You know, and of course, now everyone's watching what's going on in India, which which looks like oh, yeah. it could absolutely be, uh, you know, a, a, a tragedy of of almost unimaginable scale. And so, I think everyone's just sort of on on pins and needles. Hi, Julie. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Glad you're able to jump on. I will. Uh, people are just logging in, and we're recording, and we're live. So we'll wait a few more minutes, and then we'll get started. And um, Giuseppe, do you want us to, when we're not speaking, should we just mute and uns whatever mute and go off the screen so it doesn't like? Do we all appear on the screen? Is that how this thing works, or is that? Uh, I, I believe so. I think Is Terry it it can tell us, but I mean, we can mute. Everybody else can't. Uh, they'll be uh, putting questions in the chat and uh, and then we'll yeah. unmute while we go to our panel. They'll see just the active speaker. So you're OK to leave your camera on if you want. Right. Great. I might if the dog jumps in, I might. Um... Are you supposed to feed her before? I fed her. I fed her. <laughs> she She's eaten. She's been for a walk. We've done all things to try to have her not jump into the screen. However, my son left the house, so there's no one keeping her quiet. So <laughs> she, can, she can jump into the screen, Julie. Thank you. <laughs> you know, my dog is sleeping right next to me and he's sleep barking. And I keep thinking this, the, I'm going to light up with his noise. So I'm trying to keep him quiet as well. Who hasn't so, wondered what dogs dream about? Yeah. Chicken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mine dreams about food. That's it. Only food. Yeah, the, the dream eating is is funny. <laughs> or the running when their paws yes. flip. We're at 48 participants. Do you want to give it a few more minutes, Jim, or shall we? I think we should uh, begin. Yeah. Is that okay, Just oh, wait. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is the inaugural Wellness in uh, Surgery webinar. And you may think that the terms wellness and surgery are actually a contradiction in terms, but <laughs> we're here today to tell you that, in fact, um, uh, wellness, uh, we hope, is alive and, and well in surgery, but also to pay attention to this. Um, this initiative started actually a while ago before we entered the, the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic has um, provided a number of uh, wrinkles um, to, to all of us in terms of uh, you know, this initiative, but um, special thanks to Giuseppe uh, uh, Papia, who's on the line uh, today with us, who's going to be leading this uh, initiative along with Joanna Giddens uh, from the Department of Surgery, uh, because uh, prior to the pandemic, we actually um, took a survey. I uh, distributed and talked a little bit about uh, the survey results at one of my annual addresses in the uh, Department of Surgery at least a couple of years ago. Uh, since that time, uh, Giuseppe will talk about it, but um, we've done some focus interview uh, with faculty and those results are um, coming to us now. We should have uh, more granular data on how faculty are feeling uh, right now in the midst of the pandemic and so on. And, and those results will be shared as mentioned 
Um, I do want to welcome, of course, uh, Colin West from Mayo Clinic, and Giuseppe will be introducing uh, Colin in just a moment, and, and Julie Maggi, who's here. And Doug Brockmeyer is uh, going to be joining us uh, a little bit later uh, to talk about his um, his interests outside of uh, surgery uh, in mountaineering, which I think will be an interesting talk for all of you to hear. And Julie is the, the director of the newly formed uh, faculty wellness uh, program. So at the University of Toronto. So uh, Giuseppe, over to you. And thanks Giuseppe for organizing this. Well, thank you. And, and Joanna, uh, who's uh, our panelist uh, co-worker and has done the bulk of the organizing. Uh, so thank you, Joanna. And thanks for everybody for attending. We have pretty good representation. And, and I'll, I'll say the elephant in the room is there is no good time for this. So we tried to pick at the end of the OR before dinner, if possible. And uh, if not possible, it'll be recorded. It'll be on our website. And so thank you to everybody that's participating. Thank you, uh, Colin and Julie. And uh, I look forward to meeting Doug uh, later on this talk. Um, and a big thank you to uh, Robin Richards. So Robin Richards uh, is a former surgeon in chief at Sunnybrook Hospital. Uh, he hired me, so uh, you can blame him for anything I do. And, uh, and certainly he's been a great mentor, but he saw the, um, this initiative as something he wanted to support and has made a generous donation to our department and it has uh, supported the wellness initiative, has certainly helped with this inaugural um, event. And I say inaugural because we're planning for a few a year and the next one should be uh, last uh, uh, Monday or Tuesday of June. Uh, and any feedback that people want to give uh, to help us with that uh, would be great uh, in terms of we're organizing that now. But thank you, Robin, uh, for supporting this event and supporting our wellness. And, uh, and troubled times, I hope everybody is safe, your families are safe, and we're trying to reorganize our lives. And sometimes it feels that we are too busy to think about our own wellness, but I guess there's no better time uh, than now. Uh, we have uh, almost completed our focus interview. So, so Colin and Judy knows a bit, we surveyed uh, the whole faculty uh, at, in terms of where we are in our wellness uh, to look at at signs and things to work on uh, in terms of a focused program at our academic department. We have uh, now proceeded with qualitative uh, interviews to really get granular about how we can make things better in our environment. And then we're almost finished that and we're, we look forward to presenting that uh, later this year and into the summer and turning that into something in very meaningful uh, knowing that our environment, and as Colin's going to tell us, uh, makes a big difference in our teams. So welcome. I, I am absolutely delighted uh, to introduce Colin, and I'll introduce Julie, and this is going to be a great uh, event. And so, uh, Colin, uh, we were uh, just talking about our love of ties. I haven't worn one in a year, and it's mandatory for him to wear one at his hospital. And we're wondering, as Jim has relieved himself of his tie, if COVID will relieve all of us of these wonderful um, uh, pieces of history <laughs> and tradition. But uh, Colin, thanks so much for, uh, for, for joining our event. Uh, Dr. West is a professor of medicine and biostatistics at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, he is a, uh, a leader, global leader in medical education and physician well-being. He's the co-director of the Mayo Clinic program on physician wellness and well-being, well -being and has published extensively. And you've uh, anybody that's attended any of my talks for sure has seen his data on my slides. And so uh, we uh, welcome you, uh, and thank you so much for uh, for joining us and and helping us on our wellness journey. Well, thank you so much to everybody for organizing this and uh, for the introduction. Let me bring my slides up here. All right. Hi. Giuseppe, could you give me a thumbs up? You can see that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm on one screen here, so if, it, uh, if there are chat questions or interjections that you want me to address in real time, I would just ask that somebody uh, unmute and let me know, because the designation doesn't always pop up readily on my screen. Uh, Actually, Colin, I forgot to mention, I apologize that uh, please enter your questions in the chat. We will, if there's anything pressing or people have to go, I'll try to address them, but we do have a panel session at the end and I will collate them. Perfect. Uh, so 
I don't have any disclosures. My email and my Twitter handle are here for those who are interested. And the objectives here uh, are a bit different than my usual academic talks because much of the interest here is in learning a little bit more about our programs, processes, and history uh, to help hopefully inform and accelerate efforts at your institution so that you can uh, learn from the mistakes we've made and also some of the shortcuts that we took so that you can also advantage yourselves from those. So we'll talk briefly about the background. I know all of you are familiar with this, but it's important to start from a common uh, place. We'll talk a little bit about the history of our program and then lead into how we have viewed ongoing efforts to try to implement solutions uh, as we've built our evidence base. So uh, as most, if not all of you are, are aware, there's literature from national studies, this from Chantelle Brazo uh, in New Jersey at Rutgers, that medical students who begin medical school start with lower distress levels in essentially every measured domain than age similar college graduates. And so when we look at burnout or depressive symptoms, for example, uh, they're lower among matriculating medical students. Every domain of quality of life is higher among matriculating medical students. Unfortunately, sometime within the first couple of years of medical school, burnout, depressive symptoms, and quality of life flip. And relative to age similar college graduates, medical students suddenly are worse. And that persists throughout training and into our practices. We've partnered with the American Medical Association for a decade now. The 2020 survey is in, uh, has been uh, fielded and the results are being aggregated now. Uh, but we've got the first three surveys uh, shown here and looking at burnout symptoms among practicing physicians, uh, the overall burnout rate among United States physicians has hovered around 50%. And this is defined by experiencing uh, emotional exhaustion or depersonalization at least weekly, uh, which is a frequency that we have linked with a host of important consequences. I'll mention that in a second. Um, for those of you that are into the burnout metrics, uh, the definitions are important because comparing across measures can be tricky. The consequences uh, really and why we should care about this are relevant to every stakeholder in medicine. So from a patient standpoint, uh, burnout and distress are associated with medical and medication errors, impaired professionalism, lower patient satisfaction, and even in some uh, recent work, associations with racial bias, which affects our care delivery. From a healthcare administration standpoint, Burnouts associated with job turnover, reduced clinical hours, and other reduced patient access that's incredibly expensive to our healthcare system. It's not good for people's careers for the most part because it's not what they really want to do, and it's not good for our patients. And then from a training and practice standpoint, burnouts associated with reduced growth curves for medical knowledge acquisition, mental health concerns, and even some public safety issues. After adjusting for fatigue, burnout has been associated with increased risk of motor vehicle crashes and near misses. When we just look at job turnover and reduced hours for physicians in the United States related to burnout, it's been estimated in business analyses in partnership with the Harvard Business School to cost the United States healthcare system in excess of $4.6 billion a year. And I wanna emphasize that point because as we may talk later or in a panel, one of the pushbacks against implementing programs for well being is often, we'd love to, but boy, budgets are tight, we can't afford this. And I think the literature is very clear. It's not that we can't afford this. We can't afford not to do this. We are hemorrhaging healthcare finances without even measuring it because burnout is a constant drain on our grid. So a little bit about our history with that backdrop uh, to get us started. So prior to 2003, some of the names at Mayo and what they were doing are listed here. So Lottie Derby was a senior resident in the internal medicine training program at the University of Washington in Seattle. Tate Shanafelt was an intern at the same program. 
Now, interestingly, Tate and I grew up about 10 miles from each other in Seattle. Uh, I'm from Seattle as well. I did not do my training in Seattle, however. Lottie was actually one of Tate's senior residents when he was an intern on service. Separate from that, Tate observed some things in, during his training that really caused him concern. Things he observed among colleagues that he knew had the right professional ideals, had the needs of patients uh, at, at the forefront, but just were not able to maintain behaviors that were aligned with those professional ideals. And he wrote about that in uh, a paper uh, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2002, where he looked at burnout and its association with self-reported patient care. And burnout was associated with markedly higher rates of really concerning behaviors. Things like dismissing patients from your hospital service when you knew they were not medically safe for discharge, simply because I can't take this anymore. I've got to clear up my service. Um, and there were a whole host of other professional behaviors that all of us would agree are clearly unprofessional. And in fact, the residents themselves would agree these were unprofessional, but they felt trapped to a certain degree. Now, in 2003, I was serving as a chief resident in the internal medicine program at Mayo, and Tate had come to Mayo for his Hemonc Fellowship in 2001. And in 2003, he sent an inquiry after his annals paper had come out uh, to our then program director saying, you know, I did a little bit of this at the University of Washington. Mayo has an absolutely massive training program. Uh, is there any interest in Mayo continuing to investigate some of this work? Well. I'm an MD-PhD and my PhD is in biostatistics. So our program director said, well, I don't know anything about this stuff, but if you're talking about potentially studying something, you need to talk to someone who has a study design and analysis background. And so my program director actually said, you and Tate need to meet. I was a busy chief medical resident, I'm like who's this strange person? I don't really have time for this. We sat down for a 30 minute meeting, which was all that we would make available initially. And Tate and I were still talking two hours later. And that was the genesis of our initial longitudinal resident study, uh, known as the Internal Medicine Wellbeing or I Am Well study, which really sparked uh, most of the rest of our program. And I mentioned that story because there's a little bit of serendipity here. Uh, and Seneca has been quoted as saying, luck is the intersection of opportunity and skill. Well, we had an opportunity, we came together, uh, we had a skill set, and what resulted from that was good fortune. Now, Tate at that point was be continuing and beginning to partner with oncology and surgery leaders nationally, and all of you are familiar with his work with the American College of Surgeons and other surgical groups internationally. Lottie, in the meantime, had moved from Seattle actually to Mayo uh, in primary care, and was completing a master's in health professions education with specific interest in medical student distress and well being. So, Tate and I were working on uh, graduate medical education. Lottie was working on undergraduate medical education. Tate was beginning to branch out more into practicing physicians. And it was just natural for the three of us to sort of work together uh, as a triad. Now, in 2006, the first publication from our resident study came out in the JAMA medical education theme issue. And this linked burnout with subsequent perceived major medical errors. And this was one of the first studies that had connected burnout with something that actually might matter in patient care. Now, granted, this was not documented medical errors, but they were errors that were at least bothersome enough to our trainees that they were carrying them with them as self-reported issues uh, that were causing them distress. And as a result of this paper, in 2007, our department chair in medicine said, okay, you've presented these results in residents. I want to know what's going on in our practicing physicians, because I bet they're dealing with the same problems. So tell me what's going on with them. And our answer was, we, don't, we can't tell you what's going on with them, because it hasn't been studied. Well, he was a, a kind of hardline New Yorker. Uh, he basically slammed his hands on the table and said, well, that's not acceptable. We need to do these studies and you're going to do them. Now, well, we'd love to do them, but we need some resources. And that's really how the program on physician well-being started at Mayo Clinic. 
a research program housed within the Department of Medicine because we brought an evidence base that sparked some interest and we had a chair of medicine, a leader who said, I think this is gonna be important. Um, and his motivation was primarily around patient care rather than physician well-being per se, but he was open to the idea of, you know, maybe we take better care of patients if we ourselves are well. So our initial director was Tate, associate directors, Lottie and myself, and I mentioned the FTE here uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of our program. So people are sometimes surprised. It's only a 0.1 FTE for each of us. This is not a massive research effort initially. And then we had PRN access to a data analyst. Now, some of this was okay because with my stats background, I was able to help with a lot of the statistical side of things. Um, but to do this well and to have a real research footprint you've got to have someone on the team who's got some expertise. So after the program was started in 2007, we continued for several years working on the epidemiology of physician distress and well-being. And in the meantime, we're also serving in an informal advisory role to institutional leadership. Now, initially that started with the Department of Medicine, but rapidly we became a contact point for leaders across the rest of the entire enterprise. I would also mention, however, that I used the word informal. We did not, and we still do not, have any official role in institutional leadership. And while on the one hand that has allowed us to be somewhat above the fray, so to speak, I also think that's a limitation because we can make recommendations. We have absolutely no teeth to be able to force implementation. Just sort of an editorial comment there. Uh, we also began to work on external partnerships, not just with groups like the American College of Surgery, but even more broadly, for example, the American Medical Association. To give you an example of the influence of the advocacy efforts locally, uh, this culminated in a paper that Tate wrote with our then CEO, John Noseworthy, uh, where we listed key elements, our nine essential organizational strategies to promote physician well-being. I'm not gonna read these to you. The, the reference is one that I think should be in every library of anyone who's interested in organizational well-being. Um, but at the top, you see acknowledge and assess the problem. So just in the introductory comments, you've already taken some really important steps because uh, there are many institutions and departments who actually are unwilling for a variety of reasons to conduct the baseline surveys, to engage in the focus groups and really get the information they need to openly assess the problem. You'll get good feedback. You'll also get some tough feedback, but you've got to be open to that to earn people's trust that you're serious about making changes to help. Leadership is crucial. We have multiple papers in recent years linking leadership scores uh, how constituents rate their leaders uh, with the well-being of their constituents, and in fact, also showing that people leave when they're experiencing distress in association with how they perceive their leaders. So we go back to those costs. There are also more than financial costs to job turnover. It's costly to your culture. How do you build your culture if you have constant churn of personnel? culture is built, the, the foundations are laid down over years upon years. Hopefully that can evolve so that it's not ossified with, you know, what we did 30 years ago is the way it is. Um, but you have a difficult time maintaining a, a thread around your common values if there's too much turnover. Uh, values are important and organizational science at the bottom. But this is an example of what guided our advocacy efforts. Uh, I will mention that even though Dr. Noseworthy is author on this paper, even at Mayo, these organizational strategies are aspirational rather than fully realized. So sometimes people think, hey, you know, Mayo's got this figured out. It must be this amazing place to practice medicine because they know how to do all of this perfectly. I love working here. I've been here for 20 years, but we are by no means perfect. And so we are learning and growing along with institutions all over the rest of the world. But hopefully what we've learned 
and the advice that we can generate around the science can serve not just our institution, but organizations elsewhere. We've learned uh, in building upon other conceptual frameworks what the drivers of position well being look like. The job demands resource model is a very broad model, but distress results in the workplace when resources chronically are insufficient to meet the demands of a job. Medicine is always going to be a demanding job. It's a demanding profession. And in fact, almost anyone who has chosen the medical field embraces that. No one's looking for Friday spa days or I want my days to feel easy. People want to be supported so that that high demand job is something that they're able to bring their best self to. At the center of these drivers, you see meaning in work. I like to uh, describe this as the MVPs of well being, meaning, values, and purpose. All of these other drivers relate to meaning, values, and purpose. Workload, pretty obvious. Excessive workloads grind people down. Physicians and other healthcare professionals generally don't have a problem working hard. We've all been through rigorous, some would say grueling, training programs. Um, it's about, is that load manageable? Is there the support to allow that load to be tolerated? Uh, control, autonomy, having a say in your workplace so that you're not simply uh, uh, a widget on an assembly line. Integrating our work and home spheres, having social support and community at work, and the other drivers you can see there. But again, this focus on meaning, values, and purpose. And so as you're thinking about a well-being program, really, even more than the specific tactics that you implement, I strongly recommend filtering every one of those strategies through this lens of how does this promote meaning, values, and purpose? Because if you can promote those core values, uh, you are going to connect people who already want to deliver great care and have tremendous relationships to help their patients and their communities live better lives, you'll help them achieve those goals. Now, back to the history. In 2012, a particularly key publication in our program's history was published in what was then called the Archives of Internal Medicine and is now the JAMA Internal Medicine, the first US national study on prevalence data across all specialties. And uh, this paper almost overnight changed the nature of the questions that we would get. So prior to this paper, we got a lot of, yeah, you know, people are talking about burnout. We're not really sure this is a, a real thing. And maybe the people who are experiencing burnout are people who weren't cut out for the med medical life to begin with. After this paper came out with the prevalence data in this first study of 43 or 44% for meaningful burnout symptoms, it was impossible to argue that this was simply a few weak links, if you will. Something that prevalent has to be rooted in our systems rather than individual failings. And so suddenly, rather than, oh, is this a real issue? We were barraged with, well, come on guys, why haven't you fixed this? like almost overnight. And so, you know, you got to give us a minute. And this is an international problem uh, that's going to require collective action to study solutions. So we shifted in 2012, while the epidemiology work continued, to focusing on evidence-based solutions. And this resulted in a number of <clears throat> randomized trials, systematic reviews, and so on, and continued our informal institutional advisory role. And I'll say a bit more about some of the specific interventions in a moment. Then in 2017, we experienced our own disruption. Tate was recruited to become the chief wellness officer at Stanford. Now, Mayo then and now has not decided to go the path of identifying a specific chief wellness officer. I have my own view on uh, that decision. It's not my decision to make, um, but Tate was recruited to become uh, someone in that role at Stanford. And so at that point, Lottie and I became co-directors of the, the program on physician well-being and also continued as a group to extend our roles on national groups, particularly involving the United States, National Academy of Medicine, AAMC, ACGME, the National Board of Medical Examiners, and so on. Some of that work resulted in this paper published in JAMA in 2018, 
uh, the Charter on Physician Wellbeing. And this is meant to be really a guiding document for how we should be thinking as organizations and individuals about this issue. The four guiding principles are uh, really, I think, fairly hard to argue with. Effective patient care both promotes and requires physician well-being. This is an interdisciplinary concern that relates to the well-being of all members of the healthcare team. This is not about elevating physicians uh, to the uh, harm of other members of the healthcare team. Physician well-being is a quality marker, and it should become a marker of uh, the organizational leadership's dashboard for success. And it's a shared responsibility between organizations and individuals. There are a number of key commitments as well, and I can refer you to the paper for the details. I won't read them to you, um, but I will point out culture is crucial. And you'll see toward the bottom of this list, prioritizing mental health care is uh, a massive issue that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, emphasized even more. We need destigmatized, normalized support for mental health among our medical professionals. In the United States, our licensing and renewal regulations are often atrocious across many of our states. They require disclosure, not just of current impairment, but of any history of uh, mental health concerns uh, or other uh, aspects that involve uh, mental health disorders. And that uh, unfortunately pressures people to not disclose and not seek help, which is absolutely contrary to what is needed. And at the bottom here, you see self-care is still part of this. Certainly we need our environments to improve and support us, but we need to bring our best selves to those environments as well. And it needs to be a partnership. And then finally, in 2020, our program transitioned from the Department of Medicine to being enterprise-wide across the entire Mayo Clinic. We have sites across uh, the entire United States, um, and so we advanced to that sort of uh, scale, still with a focus on our physicians and our research scientists. And we were charged by our new CEO with developing, evaluating, and scaling solutions, particularly those that would directly improve the practice environment. He was less interested in the background epidemiology work and understanding the, the challenges and more interested in, come on, let's, let's uh, start turning the ship around. Uh, our program's baseline, baseline budgeting stayed stable, so not a huge institutional investment, but we did have presidential funds made available to us on an as-needed basis to support implement, implementation science where those costs uh, were needed. And I can say more about that later. Our objectives as a program currently are listed here. Uh, we want to increase the number of local work areas that are engaged in implementing initiatives. This is a key point because what we've learned over the years is that when you reach out to a work area and you begin to understand what the drivers of distress and well being are in that work area, you've learned really only what the drivers of distress and well-being are for that work area. They do not necessarily translate to other work areas. So you have to do the hard work of understanding at the local level and having local work units uh, be interested in engaging as partners. Certainly there are some broad themes as I've already mentioned, but which of those themes is the biggest driver in a particular work area can be a unique uh, issue from unit to unit. Uh, we try to support leaders uh, who engage in this and want practice environments to improve. We want to help groups measure the impact of their redesigns, improve our burnout markers and other markers of well being, and look at again being recognized nationally, if not internationally, for this commitment. And we have viewed this uh, in Minnesota, there has been a big push for Mayo Clinic. Uh, something called the Destination Medical Center Initiative. This idea that patients in the United States in particular, but really all over the world, would look at Mayo Clinic as a place that they would see as a destination to get the medical help that they're seeking. And we have said that needs to be expanded. It's not just about being a destination medical practice, a uh, destination medical center. We need to be a destination medical practice. 
where physicians and other healthcare professionals uh, want to work because they say, wow, that working environment allows me to thrive so effectively that I just, I dream about wanting to work at an institution that honors my commitment to the profession in that way. We recognize and we educate uh, leaders that the drivers are complex. Lots of different healthcare system aspects and elements have to work together on this. Uh, a top-down simple solution is a solution that will not be effective. But that shouldn't be intimidating. That's actually something that really strong leaders embrace because there are many different approaches that they can take. And it's actually kind of exciting to learn more about, well, in this work unit, how can we make this a little bit more unique so that we can really get this individualized? Uh, it's almost personalized medicine, but for your work unit. And that should be stimulating rather than, oh my goodness, that's an insurmountable mountain of work. Our processes generally work along this continuum. Measuring and monitoring using validated tools is crucial. Uh, having goals, having targets for what you're trying to achieve uh, is something that we ask leaders that we work with to think about very, very carefully. We can't give them those targets. They have to tell us, where are you trying to go? And then we can try and shape that to help them avoid pitfalls. Participatory design is crucial. Leaders, well-intentioned as they may be, that initiate solutions without fundamentally engaging the people who are affected and need those solutions are leaders who really are selling themselves short. This principle more broadly of nothing about me without me is really crucial. Sometimes leaders in our experience have been hesitant for that level of engagement because they feel like, well, I don't know what the answers are, so I have to give up some control. And I, I'm not comfortable with that because this might go off the rails. But in fact, we see that leaders who open themselves up to genuinely say, I have ideas, but I don't know what the best ideas are, and I need to work on this with you to help make sure that we're all going in the right direction, are leaders who are beloved by their constituents. It's actually more effective leadership. And then we need to be a learning organization that works on continually improving and having almost a PDSA cycle approach to our initiatives around well-being. So some of the specific program strategies, while well, I've already mentioned the charter, we've been very involved in the National Academy of Medicine uh, and the consensus report, uh, Lottie was very closely involved with, with this report. And I think both of these are uh, built on an evidence base that's developed over many years. Uh, this, all of these solutions and all of these strategies, the conceptual frameworks, should be grounded in good evidence. That doesn't mean that you get paralyzed by the data. You need to move from those conceptual frameworks with their evidence base to implementation. Implementation, uh, again, building on evidence, we've conducted randomized trials on uh, what are called physician engagement groups and also professional external coaching. You may have seen those trials in the literature. The physician engagement groups evolved in an interesting fashion. The first study on that involved paid time during the workday. So we actually took people out of clinic, out of the OR uh, during this trial. And for nine months, every other week for 90 minutes, they met as a group with a trained physician facilitator to talk through a variety of issues that were deemed to be broadly relevant to common physician experiences that might impact well-being. And at the end of that study, we found that the intervention group had markedly improved uh, burnout markers and other markers of well-being, uh, and they all wanted to continue. We presented that to our institutional leadership in uh, 2013 or 2014. And they came back to us with what actually was a very reasonable response. They said, you know what? We are willing to endorse this across the entire Mayo Clinic, but it's about 1% FTE that this costs each individual. And for each person that might not seem like very much, but over the, an entire prof, uh, institution that has you know, more than 4,000 physicians and scientists, that adds up to a fair bit of reduced patient access. So, 
we're committed. We'll do this if we need to. Is there any chance that you can test something that we compensate our physician participants in a different way? So we keep them in front of patients, but we fund this in a different way. And that was version 2.0 which is in press right now, actually, after several years of long-term engagement data collection, uh, where we had somewhat more relaxed physician groups, where they met on their own time with their group, and Mayo paid for their meals. So Mayo didn't pay for their FTE anymore, for their clinical time, but Mayo paid for their meals, a little bit of an organizational investment. And with that shared commitment of physicians giving their time, and the institution paying for them to meet, we found essentially identical benefits as to the facilitated time-funded groups. And that program has been in, in effect at Mayo since 2000, late 2015 now for all of our physicians and scientists. And we've had more than 2000 physicians and scientists actively engaged in these groups in a rolling uh, ongoing fashion. Other strategies have been included pushing physician well being metrics as routine markers of institutional performance. We have had varied success with this. For many years, we had our core burnout markers as uh, dashboard markers that our CEO had to report on to the uh, board of directors of Mayo Clinic. Um, I'm not sure we're completely where we need to be on that. In fact, the burnout markers have now been taken off of the dashboard, and most recently they've been replaced by a joy metric. That feels somewhat different to me. Uh, we'll see how that evolves. Again, a work in progress. We've done work on supervisor leadership scores and a training program for our physician leaders so that when areas are struggling, there is tailored coaching to bring to those leaders, not with the idea that the leaders have a punitive need uh, to be treated in some, some way like that, but to say, look, you know, you're not achieving the leadership goals that you want for yourself or for your work area. Here's how we connect you to that improvement process so that everyone benefits. Getting career fit discussions into annual reviews seems like should be obvious. It's remarkable how often that does not happen. Simply having someone in an annual review be asked, tell me a little bit about how you're balancing all of your work responsibilities. How's that going for you? Is your career going in the direction that you want? How can I help with that? Where are you struggling? In a way that people can trust, not, oh, you told me you're struggling. Now I'm going to figure out a way to punish you for that. It needs to be a genuine, you know what? We want people to flourish. We want people to thrive. We want people to meet their fullest potential. And Lottie has pioneered the uh, well-being index, which provides access to validated uh, self-calibration tools with links to resources to promote self-care. I don't have the link uh, on the screen here, but if you do a Google search, an internet search for uh, well-being index, you will readily come across the index online. For individual use, it is available free of charge. So, uh, your own pass password, your own user ID, your own uh, settings, and you can get feedback on your own self-entry of where you are on your own stress curve. Physicians are notoriously terrible at self-assessing where we are. Despite the reputation we have of complaining about things really easily, when it comes to well-being, we actually all think that we're better than our peers. Oh yeah, things are rough, but I'm, I'm handling it better than those around me. Um, this has been studied uh, in both surgeons and non-surgeons. 89% of physicians rated their well-being as above the average of their peers. Now, you don't have to have a biostatistics PhD like I do to know that 89% cannot be above average. That's some Minnesota Lake Wobegon kind of stuff. And even more concerningly, 70% of physicians who were in the bottom third for well-being thought they were above average. So our self-assessment needs help with these calibration tools. Um, there are some charges for institutional aggregate use. I'm not gonna talk about those, but again, for individual use, it's available free of charge. So in my last few minutes here, just a couple of notes about what we've been doing since we became an enterprise program to give you an idea of sort of the breadth of, of how this can be approached. So we've been tasked in the last year with really 
quick, small group experiments, not so much of a focus on heavy publication, but more, hey, can these be treated like QI initiatives, PDSA cycles? And if there's, <coughs> excuse me, if there's a publication opportunity, great, but that's not really the institutional focus. So when we think about things, the, the, the coined phrase here of expediator, this is the idea of a physician in clinic or in the hospital having someone that offloads the indirect patient care tasks so that the physician can focus on what's most meaningful to them and to their patient, their relationship with that patient. So I'm a general internist. I spend a great deal of my day typing on the computer, writing notes, entering orders, uh, doing things that really getting from what I want to have happen to implementation is work that distracts me from my patient. And so the expediator uh, pilots have involved bringing support staff in to say, you know what, I could see my patients more efficiently and with a better relationship with my patient if I had someone to help me. If I check some boxes that say I want this, 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 and this, hey, go make it happen. Then I can keep talking with my patient. And by the end of the visit, it's all been scheduled. Uh, scribes, similarly, we're working on both in-the-room scribes and virtual scribes. We've been partnering with a company called Mmodal on uh, scribes electronically and online who are remote, aren't even employed by Mayo Clinic, uh, who are able to sit in virtually on visits and populate documentation in real time as the visit is progressing. Saves our physicians an immense amount of time when this pilot ended, we actually almost had riots because the physicians who had the scribes were so uh, almost into withdrawal when the pilot, the temporary pilot was pulled back. So we're now in a position of trying to figure out how do we make this continue to happen beyond a pilot standpoint. Um, the literature on scribes in emergency rooms and in primary care clinics, at least in the United States, suggests that uh, having scribes easily pays for itself. Scribes are not particularly expensive. Uh, and in primary care practices, for example, they've enabled practices to see one or two extra patients per day, which more than pays for the scribe. And despite seeing more patients, the physicians in those studies have been more satisfied, not less. So important. Within COVID, one of the advantages has been flexibility. So We've had at Mayo at least to work remotely and doing virtual visits, video visits, for example, in a way that we've never done before. A lot of times our practice leaders would say, no, 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 you have to be in person with your patients. This is pre-COVID. Uh, flexibility in time. No, nope, you need to be here at 7.30 in the morning and you will not leave until 5.30 in the afternoon because a patient need could arise. You need to be here. What we've learned through COVID that flexibility actually can work incredibly well, both for our healthcare professionals and for our patients. So hopefully we will continue uh, those benefits, uh, the silver lining to the COVID black cloud, learn from that and be able to improve our practice environments moving forward. Um, some of these others I've already mentioned like professional coaching, uh, the Compass Extended, our uh, physician engagement groups that involve interdisciplinary teams, not just physicians or maybe even involve family members so that we expand the circle of our physicians. Uh, that has received mixed results. Um, some physicians love the idea of bringing their family in to share their family experiences. Others have felt that this is intrusive of the workplace into their home lives. So that's a very personal decision. Our general structure as a well being program has been organized around engaging work units in four tiers. The most uh, common tier, the easiest tier, is simply information sharing about best practices. Making sure that everyone understands the language, the universe around this literature, the fact that we have a National Academy of Medicine report, much like the Institute of Medicine report on To Air is Human around quality and patient safety. Many physicians and many leaders actually aren't aware of all of this information. They should not be simply discovering this for the first time without guidance. We can help them shorten their path. We can help with assessment because we have expertise from more than 15 years of doing the research. Collaborative pilots are really where we want to be. 
working in partnership, we cannot as outsiders make a work unit better simply by ourselves. This needs to be led by the work unit itself, but we can be consulting groups to help make sure that their pilots are moving in the right direction for their needs. And then finally, an aspirational goal is really having a design team where from the very beginning, from inception of the concept, we are uh, arm in arm with a work unit or a department to develop comprehensive programs for well being at their local level. And again, I say that's aspirational. We've not had time, especially with the disruption of the pandemic, to get a full design team process engaged. And if we did that, we probably need to expand our resources because, as I mentioned earlier, right now we're doing this, Lottie and I are 0.1 FTE dedicated to this function. So if you really get into design teams from the ground up, uh, that becomes a bit more of an investment institutionally. That's the kind of thing where having an office around physician well being could be extremely helpful. Again, not something that Mayo has done to date. So my last uh, slide here is simply a reminder. As you think about your uh, approach to promote physician and other healthcare professional well-being, think about the core drivers under whatever conceptual framework you embrace. This is one that we've used at Mayo, but there are other models. The National Academy of Medicine has its own conceptual framework the Stanford model is out there, there are others. Um, if these are less optimal, you push your staff toward less optimal experiences and performance. This does not have to be a negative discussion, however, because there is a flip side to that coin. If you can optimize meaning, values, and purpose in work, if you can meaningfully promote a sense of community at work, uh, if you can connect people with all of the honorable aspects of this magnificent profession, then you can push them in a more optimal direction towards engagement, flourishing, and thriving in their careers. That's not just good for your physicians, it's good for your patients, it's good for your bottom line, it's good for the culture of your organization. So with that, uh, I will stop. I do see that there are some questions in the chat. My email, my Twitter handle is here. I'm gonna stop sharing. I can see the chat here, uh, and I will let uh, I will perhaps let the organizers here direct my attention uh, as you would like me to focus. But thank you again all for the invitation, and I look forward to hearing some of the rest of the conversations over the next hour or two. Thanks so much, Colin. That's uh, some fantastic work that you've been. Uh, leading and uh, we're learning a lot from. Um, there have been some questions. I think I'll save them for the panel uh, as uh, we'll, uh, we'll move. Uh, I think they'll apply to many members, some of the questions in the chat. And uh, some one of them I'll say was about uh, uh, availability of slides and this is being recorded and they'll be available on our website. But now um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, someone who many people know here at the university, but uh, Julie Maggi. Uh, and Julie is uh, uh, one of our assistant professors at the Department of Psychiatry, but many know uh, she's uh, a great friend and a tremendous help uh, during a tough time last year with our department, with me and many members, uh, but many of our trainees as well. As she uh, did a tremendous job in serving as a role of Director of Postgraduate Wellness and now is our newly appointed Director of uh, Faculty Wellness. and. Uh, uh, we look forward to hearing what uh, what's available for us and what the plans are for the future. So thank you so much, Julie. Great. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, let's see. Let me, I'm uh, technologically challenged, but I think there we go. Uh, I can't see anyone, but I can hear you. Can you see the slides, Giuseppe? Can you swap displays, though? We're seeing your um, your presenter view. Let me see. You're seeing my presenter view. Near the top left, you should see a swap display. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, can you see the right one? Perfect. Great. Thank you. So, thank goodness for uh, technological support. Um, oh, did it go? 
There we go. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. It's, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I was asked to speak a bit today about the development of our faculty wellness program. Uh, and so I'm happy uh, to do that and privileged to do that. And I hope uh, as a side effect, I can inspire a couple of people uh, uh, to engage with us at some point in our journey. I have no disclosures. You all know how to reach me if you want to. So I show you this picture to start with because I feel like this is the um, this is the path that starting the wellness program has taken. Uh, it's a bit uh, circular at times, but um, there is a path in there nonetheless. And I'm going to walk you through that. And again, with a side hope that you all, uh, some of you get engaged uh, to work with us. So I think one of the things that you will note throughout this presentation is that it is uh, consistent, I think, in themes um, and underlying foundation to what you just heard from, um, from Dr. West. Uh, and um, uh, and I, um, what do I hope? So I hope that in seeing that, you'll see that we're all kind of gravitating around uh, an evidence base that's an important one that I hope to bring to the faculty. So why are we doing this as a faculty? So uh, first and foremost, attending to the well-being of our faculty is really about preserving our human capital. Um, and as Dr. West pointed out, there's a growing evidence base that should guide us. Uh, and this is an evidence base that I will uh, assert, and you'll hear me talk about it again and again, that we all, uh, as leaders in the department, um, and as active members of the department need to become familiar with because there's a lot uh, at stake for us. So really it's this evidence base that um, exists, that's growing, that we hope to contribute to, that we really need to turn to when we are uh, planning how to enhance our well-being at work and how to buffer the inevitable difficult uh, occupational stresses of the work that we're in. Uh, and as Dr. West pointed out, this doesn't all have to be negative. What we are striving for by looking at, you know, values, meaning, and those different um, factors that impact on our well-being at work is to actually have engaged, healthy, productive, energetic people who are committed to their work with patients, to the work of the organization. So how are we doing? So you've... Um, uh, there's a lot of data coming out of the Department of Surgery, thanks to um, uh, Giuseppe and team. Um, but just so that you know, uh, at the faculty, we also um, run uh, the Voices of surveys. So you've probably heard of the voice of the med student, the voice of the resident, the voice of the clinical fellow. So if you think back a couple of years ago, there was also the voice of the faculty. Uh, you'll be seeing all of these Voices surveys every two years. Uh, because um, one of the things the faculty is committed to doing is to um, measuring various um, uh, important factors uh, in our uh, workplace, including well-being being one of them. Uh, so a couple of years ago, this was pre-COVID, the voice of the faculty um, helped us understand how many of our faculty were burned out. Uh, and what some of the factors were that were contributing to that burnout. Now this, uh, you know, because it's such a high level study, it did not go into the kind of detail that Dr. West spoke to about at the unit level, really knowing what's going on in, you know, in the various sort of small places, the micro places in our environment, but this was a larger scale uh, study. So we discovered that um, as a whole, as a faculty, this includes basic science, rehab, so our, you know, our tenured faculty as well, as well as clinical faculty, 17% reported, reported uh, always or almost always feeling burned out over the preceding 12 months. And one of the factors, there were many factors that um, were found to be correlated, but one of them was work hours. So 60 hours, if you can believe it, seemed to be that, that uh, cutoff between uh, significantly more people reporting burnout. Uh, the other um, uh, relationship that we found consistently, and this is in all the voices of surveys, was that those who were experiencing uh, um, harassment, discrimination, um, more commonly reported feeling burned out. Um, Okay, so what did the faculty do? So this, this predated me, uh, where Dean Young, um, you know, it, put together this information as well as extensive uh, stakeholder engagement as you, you, you know, those of you who are around around 2018 
we'll know that there was a lot of stakeholder engagement around the strategic plan. And one of the consistent areas that came out was the importance of supporting the health and well being in everything we do. So that really has to be something foundational in our faculty. Um, and to you can probably hear in the background, there are uh, a number of children from the street. <laughs> so I apologize if you can hear uh, background uh, home stuff going on. Uh, so uh, the second thing that they we did at the faculty was um, Dean Young struck a faculty wellness working group. And so myself and Lynn Wilson, one of, the, one of our vice deans, uh, co-chaired that. Uh, and there were uh, Giuseppe from your department, um, as well as a number of other surgeons and individuals from the uh, across all departments came together to really do a very extensive literature review, uh, including um, a review on wellness and burnout, a review about how to measure it. Um, and uh, in addition, we connected with uh, local experts. We connected with a number of individuals um, across the um, Canada and the US, uh, including Dr. West, who may or may not remember a phone call from a couple of years ago. Uh, and we did a review of professional values. And all of that uh, resulted in a, uh, an extensive set of recommendations to the faculty. So just as those recommendations were going to start being um, implemented, uh, oh, sorry, one more thing before I tell you about just before the recommendations start to be implemented. One of the important things, um, and again, you'll see this uh, again and again when we talk about faculty wellness, and that is that um, it can be tempting, uh, and it's sometimes you see the temptation uh, reflected on Twitter uh, or in the news or in our day-to-day -day conversations, it can be very tempting to try to reduce um, uh, the sort of etiology of well-being to one or two things. Um, but in fact, we know, we know from the literature and we know from our experiences that it's really a very complex uh, interaction of an individual in an organization in a system affected by a culture. And in all of these, the relationships are bi-directional. So um, uh, we, one of the things that we, I think, always have to do is to uh, keep this structure in mind. Uh, and indeed, you know, a, a, a simple example is, uh, as uh, Colin West pointed out in his talk, you know, if there's a, a reward demand balance, right? So if you're demanding too much of people and there's insufficient awards, sorry, awards, rewards, and rewards can be monetary, rewards can be thanking someone, rewards, you know, there's, there's many categories of what a reward can look like. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, how... Um, I don't even want to say strong, what your internal resilience is. If you're being asked to do too much, um, eventually you're not going to be able to do it and it's going to impact on your well-being at work. So yes, yeah, so we had all these recommendations um, ready to be put in place. And I think um, Dr. Young was ready to proceed with them. And then this hit the papers and you can't see the, the top of the slide got cut off in the presentation, but it's the first case of coronavirus um, hit uh, Toronto. So and this was, um, in case any of you forgot, January 25th of 2020. So that really, um, uh, sidetracked everything as I think you know it did for everybody in every area uh, and so um, rather than embark on the initial recommendations there was a pause and um, uh, I for a period of time agreed to take on a role as the faculty uh, COVID coordinator to really just help put some immediate things in place um, in the context of COVID. Uh, and so this, I don't know if, uh, how many of you in the group have, um, have seen this. Uh, this is uh, actually a, an emotional response scale to disaster. Um, and this is something that in the well-being literature, especially around COVID, is really uh, being displayed a lot. And perhaps thankfully, I don't know, we all, we, we, we tend to um, respond to disasters as groups in somewhat um, consistent ways. I think the challenge in, in this external disaster, so to speak, is that it's gone on and on um, much past a year, um, and it will continue to go on before the acuity um, is over. So um, I, I show you this only to say that in as we're thinking about what we need in the faculty, we, um, we really have to think about where we are in response to and recovering from the acuity of um, the current events. 
Uh, we know, just to give you a bit of a sense of what grounded us to develop what we did during COVID, we know from previous pandemics that um, uh, healthcare workers experience psychological stress uh, in a pandemic, and that uh, distress tends to continue for a few years post pandemic. Um, the interventions, uh, uh, the interventions of psychological responses and, and supports are actually largely not psychological per se, but are, are um, around initially uh, basic needs and resources, including safety. So things like PPE, availability of food, water um, on site, and then the provision of important information to help people feel um, uh, capable and competent at what they're doing and to normalize um, emotional responses. And um, again, most people, everyone will need the what's on the bottom of the triangle. A large number of people will need the information. And then a smaller number of people will need um, support and psycho uh, psychological first aid. And a very small number of people will need a psychiatric uh, or psychological uh, intervention. So this is the frame with which we instituted some supports uh, immediately during COVID. And so what did we do? We um, had a, uh, and this still exists, there's a wellness resource page for faculty. And on that page, you can be linked not just to informational resources, but also links to group and individual um, support. Um, we established a resource navigation line, which still exists, although we'll probably get rid of the phone number and just have the email and then we will respond, um, sort of call people back as needed. Uh, and what's fascinating about this, because um, probably, uh, as Colin West said, we don't self-assess so well. We also, the literature tells us, don't reach out very well. So we didn't have, we had a couple of handfuls of people only use the resource navigation. We had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hits to the um, wellness um, resource webpage. Uh, other things we did, again, thinking about the provision of information to increase competence and capacity during COVID was run some um, specific COVID-related uh, webinars, COVID wellness-related webinars. We also, um, uh, in our needs assessment, we, we did a quick and dirty needs assessment of the faculty, and the most uh, asked for, the most largest stress was around childcare for people with young families. Uh, and so, um, you know, a lot of hospitals have developed relationships with some local child care providers, and so did the, the, uh, the faculty. Um, it's not free, but nonetheless, the relationship is there for those having difficulty finding uh, connections. Uh, and importantly, we started a uh, leading for wellness community of practice. So there's currently about 30 leaders who are in two facilitated groups, and really those groups are about teaching some of the, the basic principles of leading during a crisis. Um, and I would say with strong reference to the global principles of how you um, um, affect change um, uh, in terms of well -being, like improving the well-being of um, people who work uh, under you. Um, so how are we faring in this pandemic? So uh, I don't need to tell this group that on the, the things such as moral distress, uncertainty, concerns about safety, lack of control have all impacted um, uh, everyone. And the we know from, again, the growing literature that the dis, there's been a disproportionate impact on certain groups, um, including women in academic medicine, uh, and other factors that can cause further negative impact. Or they're exacerbated by um, some issues of ethnicity, indigeneity, sexual orientation, status as a migrant. So you don't need to go far in the news or in the literature to, to see these themes emerging. Bob Maunder uh, is a psychiatrist at Mount Sinai Hospital, and he and his team there are collecting um, local data. Uh, and what they're finding, um, this is presented with his permission because none of it's um, published yet, but what they're finding when looking at um, uh, severe cutoffs for emotional exhaustion, uh, as well as screening for uh, mental illness, they are finding um, in the two screens that they've done so far, so one was done October, November 2020, and the follow-up was done January February of 2021, and they will continue to follow people. I think they're 
I think it's about seven or eight times that they're, um, they're following up with the same individuals, that the rates are much higher than SARS and are um, the positive screens for mental, the, the screens for mental illness are um, coming out positive as opposed to SARS, there was no um, increase in rates of mental illness. And in fact, the numbers that we're seeing locally are similar to what you'd see after uh, something like Hurricane Katrina. So the numbers similar to a large external disaster. Uh, and I, I might add that um, uh, the work at Sinai is in the presence of uh, a lot of built-in supports, uh, including um, uh, the, their status as a magnet hospital, which is sort of a, a lot of internal supports built in, especially for nursing care around autonomy, around decision making. And so a lot of these principles that Dr. West talked about are, are um, built in uh, at Sinai. And so I think this helps me understand that what we really need to think about in building our program in this next phase of recovery is that everything we're doing now is to mitigate the distress um, and sort of the occupational hazard of working during a pandemic and um, hopefully decrease the distress enough to decrease the rates of uh, mental illness. Um, so lots to look at coming out there locally. So in our faculty of medicine, now what, what we're trying to do is to come together that the overall vision is to create a better quality of work life for our faculty. And to do this, we, I think we need to be inspired at all levels to value and innovate for well being um, uh, of all the members of our faculty so that all our faculty members know that their well being is important. And with an ultimate goal of faculty members doing their job to the best of their ability. So, what we are doing now that uh, our formal program is in place is we, uh, Jim will know, I've been meeting with all the chairs to try to understand the themes through the departments and what people need. Uh, and I won't get into all of that now, but what we are imminently starting is first to collaborate through our TASM partners. So we've seen if one thing that we've seen through COVID is that when we want to come together uh, as a TASM group, we can do it and we can do things quickly and effectively. And so our hope is to continue um, the collaboration around wellness. And certainly there's already been some collaboration, um, but my hope is to bring people together so that we can learn from each other, share ideas, engage in evaluations together and collaborate around all the amazing things that are happening at the different sites. Um, I hope to support the appointment um, of department wellness leads uh, and so um, and to meet regularly with those leads so that they can then support wellness activities in their departments. Um, and there's, again, a large literature and um, uh, a lot that we can learn, teach the wellness leads and then have them wellness leads learn from each other. So hopefully as a faculty, we'll be able to come together. Uh, and we're establishing a faculty affairs advisory committee to work closely with professional values and equity, diversity, and inclusion leads. And importantly, this is some version of this diagram you will, you will see over the next um, few years, I'm sure. Uh, one of the things that we bear in mind at the faculty is that equity, diversity, and inclusion, and professional values, wellness, and safety are closely intertwined. So at the, um, we know that you uh, are not going to behave really well at work if you're totally burned out. Um, and so those, there's a bi-directional relationship between the two. So in fact, we know that a lot of times when people aren't in quotes behaving well, it is in fact that they're burned out. Um, we can't be well if we don't feel safe at work. And so, um, so this is, you know, a, a model that I think we have to keep uh, close in mind when we think about all the factors that impact on um, our well-being at work. Uh, other things that we will uh, that we're working on is uh, harness the power of leadership to bolster, bolster well-being. So some of the we've started work in the communities of practice. Um, fairly in, in the next few weeks, we'll be announcing a consultation service for leaders. So you know, at the faculty, uh, we in our little group in the faculty of medicine, we're not the, the main workplace. The workplace, the unit level work happens on the ground. And so our hope is that we can work on developing uh, leading practices uh, and support departments and individuals and units around consultation uh, to work on things locally at their site. 
Um, and lastly, the voice or second last, the voice of the faculty will continue and it will um, hopefully we'll be able to use it as a faculty as a marker of how we're doing. I think if we don't measure, although it's a pain to measure, if we don't measure, we won't know how things are improving. So things need to be measured globally, but all, uh, at the faculty and at the unit level. Um, we at the, the faculty uh, program isn't going to become a treatment program. Uh, so, you know, at the, at the top of the triangle, there's some people who will need treatment and support. What I hope is that we will be able to have uh, resources available for people, provide training to leaders on how to recognize and support people who might be in distress and get them connected to the supports that they need um, uh, wherever that may be, we'll have a, a host, hopefully, of, uh, of partners to collaborate with. And finally, our family Department of Family and Community Medicine is just getting on board um, a collaboration with us to uh, start a project called Docs for Docs, which is uh, a project to link family physicians um, with faculty members who may not have one. Uh, and lastly, uh, we our, our hope is eventually to be, this is not in our you know, first six months, but I would say in our first 18 months um, to start a program of research where we will be able to collaborate internally, but also with uh, external partners with a particular focus of looking at um, gender uh, and underrepresented groups or having, and having a, things like having dis a disability and the intersection of those and the impact on well-being. Thank you. And I uh, raced through that, but I hope I stayed in time and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions during the panel talk. Thanks so much, uh, Julie, for another great talk and for all the work you're doing here at the faculty. Um, it's very much appreciated. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jim to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Bruckmeyer. Yeah, great, thanks, uh, <laughs> Giuseppe, and uh, it uh, and, and thank you, Julie, for your your presentation. So it gives me great pleasure. We we thought um, to wrap things up here. You know, we've been talking, um, you know, uh, pretty concertedly about um, you know, stress and burnout and and wellness, which are are very important themes. And uh, trying to mitigate against it is something that really has come up in part through what Colin had mentioned, and which is you know. Uh, the, the practice and promotion of self-care, you know, pursuing uh, things outside of the workplace, you know, that um, bring balance into your lives, um, passions uh, for things like your hobbies and so on. And uh, Colin had a, a, a slide that uh, talked about fitness anywhere. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Doug Brockmeyer. Doug's a, a friend. He is a pediatric neurosurgeon. He's in Utah, Salt Lake City, and so he's two hours behind. He just finished his OR list, as, as I understand it. So I have a, a brief introductory slide um, that I hope you can all see about uh, Dr. Brockmeyer here. And um, so um, we've known each other for years. He's currently the chief of the Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the University of Utah. He did his undergrad at uh, Harvard uh, University. He uh, then went on to do uh, medical school at Case Western uh, Reserve in Cleveland, residency at, uh, in Salt Lake City at the University of Utah. He's uh, risen the ranks all the way up to full professor of uh, neurosurgery there. And uh, his, he's got a subspecialty interest in cranial cervical and spinal surgery. And recently, he just completed, and I'm sure he's relieved uh, with this uh, task, but he was the co-chair of the editorial board, having served for uh, five or more years on the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, did a great job uh, for the journal. But he's uh, an avid outdoors enthusiast. I think living in uh, the mountains and uh, being in Salt Lake and uh, near some great uh, outdoor activities, um, has led Doug to pursue these activities. And so skiing, biking, mountaineering, and so on uh, are things that he does all the time. Uh, and, but he did something that's pretty extraordinary, which is um, to climb um, a, a serious mountain. I'm gonna have him talk all about that. Um, as I think uh, he'll probably reflect on why he decided to do that at that stage in his career and, um, and to tell us a little bit about it. And it, it, I hope it'll spawn some further discussion for all of us. So Doug, welcome. 
great to have you here at the University of Toronto. I hope you've been able to figure out how to share your, your screen here for us, because I think you have a few slides to share with us too. Great, thank you, Jim, so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great, we'll try to share a screen. And I first, I wanted to just thank you quickly for those kind words and it means a lot coming from you a person that we all look up to and the epitome of academic neurosurgery and neurosurgery in general so thank you so much and thank you for letting me be part of your of your wellness symposium so we will see if we can get this to share and if it works that's going to be awesome um are we seeing what we should be seeing yeah, yeah, we're good. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're good. Okay, great. So uh, as Jim alluded to, I went on a little trip. It was about 16 years ago, and it led me to the top of of Mount Everest. And in the in the interim, I've had a fair amount of time to reflect on the trip and what it meant. And I'm going to share some of my thoughts and how it could fit into our busy lives. And and just kind of what 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 it means to me after 16 years of of, of cogitation on the on the topic. So uh, we're going to get going here. First, I wanted to point out that my institution and your institution have strong ties. Uh, in particular, the pediatric neurosurgery ties are 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 extremely uh, tight and beginning with Dr. Jack Walker, who was maybe the first and one of the very first pediatric neurosurgery fellows ever at the University of Toronto. And then I've had the privilege of him being my mentor. And I've had three amazing either current or former partners, John Kessel, Jay Reva Cameron, and, John, and, and Sam Cheshire, who've trained and done their fellowships or training at University of Toronto. And there's just a lot of back and forth, and there's a lot of similarities, I think, between the two institutions and the type of people that they attract. So uh, I, I am lucky to be, in fact, John is doing a shunt for me right now on, on a busy call day. So I, 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 I love John and uh, he's, he's a great friend. So uh, yeah, greetings from Utah. Uh, as Jim alluded to, uh, a lot of this is in our back door, in our backyard. Um, and many of you have probably been out here to ski or enjoy the summer activities or fish or, or, or visit the national parks. And maybe it's been limited over the last year or so, but we look forward to seeing you down the future. And you're right, it's kind of this big open air gymnasium in a way that you can go out and do things that, that, are, that are fun, that are not that far away. So I'll begin by sort of asking the question that I've asked myself a lot and people who don't climb maybe wonder as well as just why climb? You know, why, why do this at all? It's, it's, it's crazy. And if you um, listen or believe George Lay Mallory, it's obviously because it's there. It's sort of the famous quote, you know, in the, in the early 1900s, the sort of British uh, patriarchal uh, and an and imperialistic type of point of view. It's there, we're gonna conquer it, and, and including Mount Everest. So that's been sort of the standard uh, reply for most people who climb, and we're gonna explore that a little bit as the talk goes on. So to do something like this, obviously someone, a person needs inspiration and uh, everybody has their own story. I'll share a little bit of mine and some of my inspirations over time. So. Uh, the, the younger people in the audience will laugh at this. This is my very first Instagram post back in 2016 with my dad. Uh, and we went to Philmont Scout Ranch and I spent a lot of time in the mountains uh, with my father and my, and my family. And I had a whole, I had a total of 11 likes, which was pretty cool, I thought. And, uh, but, you know, this was the genesis. This was the start of, of my outdoor experience. Uh, and I was only, uh, you know, 13 at the time, but it led to many, many adventures and, and, and lots more over, over the years. So I have a huge um, debt of gratitude for him. And then shortly thereafter, I, I was exposed to climbers in the Southern California. I grew up in Southern California, Southern California area, including uh, uh, the, the, the Chouinard Equipment Company. And this is a book that came out in the 70s called Climbing Ice by Yvonne Chouinard. And many of you may know him as 
president and CEO of the Patagonia uh, 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 Corporation for many, many years. But before that, he was really a world-class climber and put up many, many difficult climbs in Yosemite. And he, he really pushed for a, an ethos where you did as much as you possibly could with as few tools as possible, a very clean style of climbing, but also sort of a very clean way of looking at the world too, right? And, and it, can, it sort of frames your, your conversation with others in the world and how you're gonna uh, uh, negotiate the complex uh, life that you have ahead of you. So this was extremely influential to me. I think I read the book about 50 times. And here's a little quote from it. it says, rock climbers think their world is stable. Alpinists, or, or what or Yvonne Chouinard is, are less illusioned. Frost wedging and thermal cracking have left their landscape shattered, loose at hand and hanging overhead. They have learned to tiptoe, to travel light and move fast. And I think that you could probably apply that quote to a lot of things, especially, you know, surgery in a lot of ways. I mean, for, for, for God's sake, you know, we, we deal with you know, unstable spines and aneurysms that are ready to rupture or bleeding during surgery. And in some ways you do have to learn how to travel light and move fast and be efficient and, 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 and keep your head about you in these circumstances. And alpinism is just one example of that. And there's many others, but I, I think these are, these are very uh, influential uh, concepts. So again, the, the book is full of pictures like this where you know, people in these really kind of tenuous spots. And I mean, for God's sake, you know, here I am a teenage kid in California and this just inflames my imagination, right? It's just, you look at this and you just go, oh my God, this is, this is what I want to do. You know, this is who I want to be. And, uh, and, 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 and you're gonna, and you're gonna really pursue this with all your energy. And, but, you know, you're going to get pushback when you start talking to your parents, you know, I need to borrow the car to go climbing, you're going to, they're going to start talking about risk and getting hurt. And I just wanted to bring this quote up, which I thought is interesting by Lionel Torre from the Conquistadors of the Useless. He's a famous climber. And this pertains to all surgical disciplines as well. Running risks is not, is not the object of the game, but it's part of it. Only lengthy experience, enabling observations to be stored up both in memory and in the subconscious, endows climbers with a sort of instinct, not only for detecting danger, but for estimating its seriousness. And I think we do this continuously, right? You know, those of us who, who operate in, or, or any kind of invasive procedures, you know, we take patients, we, we take responsibility for them, they trust us. And we, but I think it goes beyond just detecting danger but sometimes estimating its seriousness, there are calculated risks that you're going to take uh, on the behalf of the patient. The patient has nothing, knows nothing about these risks or these calculations going on in your head, but over time, you're able to, to, to make sense of them and come to terms with them in your own mind. So I think that's a sign of, of a strong, um, a, 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 an accomplished surgeon sort of a master surgeon in the way to be able to manage these things that you can detect danger, but also estimate its seriousness because not every situation is catastrophic. So this is me again, full of beans. This is in the 1990s down in Southern Utah on top of Castleton Tower. Obviously, you know, a happy guy in a happy place down in Southern Utah, did a lot of climbing down there over the years. Super lucky to be part of that area. And then this is basically almost at my back door. This is when like, a, like an hour of my, of my house up in the Wasatch Range. And I've done a lot of skiing and ski mountaineering over time. And that led me to bigger and better things. This is a, a picture taken with a friend of mine in Alaska in the Ruth Gorge, uh, which is an area just, just amazingly beautiful and amazingly vast. And the scale of it is just, it, it's just really hard to get your mind around. And you're confronted with these, with these uh, places that, that, are, that are inspiring, but sort of terrifying at the same time. So, and did a lot of this, you know, this is, you know, a, a big serious route in Alaska, uh, you know, with a pack on our back, and we're going to spend a couple nights out in the mountains, you know, in Alaska. And 
you know, this is, uh, you know, pretty serious business and it's risky, but, you know, it, it's, it was just the ticket. It was just what I want. I was, I was right where I wanted to be at any particular moment. So I was lucky to share these things with my, with my friend Jeff here. But then even with all of these experiences, I know in my heart, I still had a long, long way to go. And I, I don't think that anybody, and anybody, if you're, if you're 50 or older, maybe 55 or older, you can raise your hand and remember the National Geographic magazines coming out with pictures of, of you know, Americans on Everest and British on Everest. That's a long time ago. That was in the 50s. But you know, but everybody would think that that's something that they might want to do at some point in their life. You know, why not me? You know, I could go to the top of Mount Everest. And uh, it, it's a dream that we all sort of aspire to secretly in our mind. And uh, but I think at that point, if I started entertaining this thing seriously, this idea seriously, I knew I had a long, long way to go. And I had a lot to learn in order to be safe. So, yeah, that's the question. Why Everest? You know, is it for me? Is it for anybody? You know, in this day and age, it maybe it's for everybody. I mean, everybody's seen the pictures with the lines. Maybe everybody and their dog is up there, you know, attempting to climb Everest. But you really have to sort of do some soul searching if this is something that you really that you really want to do because it's a big sacrifice. So I had been climbing in Alaska and Europe and Ecuador and Peru, and I thought I had that checked off and I had good experience there, but I'd never been to the Himalaya. And that's a whole nother ball game. That's a whole nother level. And I knew in my mind that, again, I had a long way to go. I had a lot to learn, but I, I had this strong drive and desire to do this. So I turned. So here's so here's what you're dealing with. So here's. Mount Everest, uh, 29,028 feet uh, tall, uh, you know, really an impressive mountain. The, the, the regular route from the, this is a picture taken from the Nepal side and you're scaling that right-hand ridge. Uh, and we're gonna show more pictures of that as time goes on, but that's sort of the objective, you know, who can't fall in love with a, with a, with a picture like that and a mountain like that, right? So, I knew I needed help in order to think about achieving this goal. And one is that you need logistics, you need help, you need Sherpa support, you need food, you need oxygen, you need tents, you need all sorts of stuff. So what you do these, at least in 2005, when I was there, and it's still the case, is that you need basically a logistical package. And it's like, it's basically like buying a new Subaru. <laughs> That's kind of what it boils down to. And it, it, it gives you these things and these companies specialize in providing logistics for Everest. And that includes all the fees and whatnot. And so that handles the logistics side. And then what I knew I needed, I needed somebody to climb with. And I didn't want to go with a big group. You know, you, everybody's probably read into thin air and you know, all these books where there's all these people and everybody's in line and there's all this competition amongst the climbers and so forth. That's what I didn't want to do. And I wanted to just find one person uh, to go with, an experienced person who'd been to the Himalaya. And I found him and his name is Dave Hahn, uh, a very, a, a, a big gregarious guy, very funny. Uh, at that particular moment, uh, when I met him, he had summited Everest four times in eight tries. But more important to me, he had turned around from the top uh, within 500 meters twice. So you knew that if we were getting close and it was getting risky and there was past the turnaround time, he didn't have a problem turning around and going home and staying safe. So that was the kind of guy I wanted to be with. And in the meantime, I mean, so you know, obviously when I was with him, you know, we chalked up one more. He's gone on to, for a total of 15 Everest summits, and he holds the record for the highest number of Everest summits as a Westerner. And I believe that the, for the, 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 the uh, Nepali record, I think is 23 going on 24 this year. If I, if I, uh, uh oh, can you guys see where I'm having? <laughs> 
Wow. Okay, we're going to keep going. I like the light effect. <laughs> okay. So uh, hopefully nobody gets a seizure. So uh, so here's so for, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, what Terry, I think uh, Doug is frozen. If you hear me, yeah, uh, he is frozen. Yeah, um, I'm just looking if there's any anything I can see on our end, but it looks like he's still here, but but not connected. Yeah, he may have had a a power issue. <laughs> it looked like with his lights. <laughs> Looks like Jim may be sorting it out. One thing we could do is turn to some of the questions from the panel while we wait and uh, be efficient, but I'll see if Jim is... Uh... He, uh, he's going to log back in. He's going to try. But yeah, if you want to take some questions, that's great. Uh, see where... I'm not sure, sure how much time I, I, we'll take him. Well, the, the one that uh, has come up in, in a couple of different ways and uh, mentioned, I think, in Julie's talk is this uh, moral distress and second victim syndrome currently. Uh, with our surgeons and, you know, uh, uh, about how resource allocation is done on a, a government level, but we can't make a decision. And some, some of us are watching our patients not get treated. And so the question is, uh, and I'll direct it uh, to Colin, um, has this changed your approach to physician uh, well, uh, well-being at the Mayo Clinic? And, and how do you handle things like the second victim syndrome? Yeah, so the short answer is yes, it has changed things to the extent that we need a structure for support. So it's an extension of this idea of our healthcare professionals needing support in their general professional lives. And then we just amplify that by an order of magnitude. And I think this is an example, at least at Mayo, where we actually adapted and adopted an approach that was not present for physicians previously. Um, and I'll, I'll stop in just a second and let Dr. Brockmeyer jump back on here. Uh, but uh, we actually had something called the HELP program, stands for Healing the Emotional Lives of Peers, that was active for our nurses working in intensive care. And we had, it had never been extended to other groups of healthcare professionals, which in retrospect seems sort of shocking, um, but it was just an absolute blind spot. And it's this absolutely brilliant program that one of our nurse practitioners uh, had worked on a master's thesis on. Um, and uh, it's this idea of getting people trained to provide some of this support that can be as simple as debriefing sessions or as complex as as, uh, as Julie mentioned, connecting people with more advanced levels of help uh, that many of us are not trained for and that they need specific expertise to deal with. Um, and you know, this, the second victim idea is certainly nothing new. Al, Al Wu was writing about this uh, at Hopkins more than 20 years ago. Uh, and you know, COVID has absolutely thrust that into the spotlight again. But my view on it is it's really more of a, a reminder that we need specific focus to support our healthcare professionals in every aspect of the stresses that we deal with. It's incredibly rewarding work, but we deal with a lot of suffering as well. And we want to be empathic and engage with our patients. How do we balance that so that we're not uh, falling down the well, so to speak, uh, but also staying connected with our patients with those relationships that are so rewarding for everyone. Great. And I uh, will pass it to Julie after we get uh, the, we're all used to these technical, um, this is part of life. <laughs> it's okay, so Doug. normal now. It's, 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 it's quite comical, but thanks Colin. And I will get Dr. Uh, Brockmeyer back. Okay, Doug. Yeah. You guys had a power outage. It sounds like so. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a first a power outage during Grand Rounds presentation. So yeah, that's 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 a first. So okay, let's just see. Uh, 
it's not what we want. We want this screen there. Okay, there we go. All right. Here we go. All right. So, so for those of you uh, unfamiliar, sort of with the with the Everest uh, uh, plan, uh, you get to base camp, which is I don't have a pointer, unfortunately, that works on on Keynote, but you get to base camp at the bottom. That's a seventeen thousand five hundred feet approximately, and then you go up to Camp One. Uh, you go through the Kumbu Icefall into Camp One, spend a few days acclimatizing, and then come down and you rest, and then you go up to camp two, spend a few days, come down and you rest, you go to camp three and repeat. So those are called rotations. And the rotations last anywhere from a couple of days to a week. And you spend, you know, two or, you know, two or three rotations, it probably takes three weeks total to go through this whole process in order to get acclimatized. Uh, and then once you've spent the night at camp three, uh, typically, you're ready to push on to the summit. So your next push up the mountain is for the summit. And that's when you go up to Camp 4. And that's at 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet. And you spend the night there and then go to the summit. So that's sort of the general, general idea. So the first thing you do is you take a uh, airplane to Lukla Airport. You get on Yeti Airlines and uh, with all your friends and you... Uh, Put your pack on your back and you start walking. So this is the trek up the uh, Kumbu Valley on a well-worn trail here. Uh, the woman with the scarf is my wife, Debbie. This was actually our honeymoon. I took her to Everest Base Camp for my honeymoon. So uh, that, was, that, was, that was pretty cool. So uh, anyway, so we had a great time. We trek all the way up to, to Everest Base Camp. But what was more important to me along the way was about a 10-day trek in is to get yourself in the right frame of mind. And what I did, I mean, everybody's probably heard of the Buddhist, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the concept of the Noble Eightfold Path, and there's right view and right speech and right conduct and so forth. But what I focused on was right mind, right intent, that I had, uh, that, that I had myself in the right place mentally that I know that I was not in charge of the ultimate outcome of the expedition. You know, we're hoping and praying to be safe, uh, but ultimately the outcome is not necessarily in my control. And then right intent, you know, every, every step I took, I was doing it with intention and, and purpose and, uh, uh, and, and with a clear goal in mind. And I think this type of thing really sort of helped, uh, helped me at least personally focus. So you uh, come around a corner about halfway through the trek, and there it is, Mount Everest. So on the right-hand side, the steep uh, mountain is Ama de Blom. The one in the middle with the sort of the cloud coming off it is Lhotse. That's another 8,000 meter peak. And the one peaking behind it on the left-hand side is Everest. And you just look at this and you just go, no way, man. It is it's too high, too far, too cold too windy, no way. We're never, we're never doing that. And uh, that's kind of what's going through your head. So that was our first glimpse of Everest. Uh, you arrive at base camp, start to acclimatize. One of the first big things that happens is at the puja ceremony. So that's when the Buddhist monk from the local monastery comes up and you have a, a, a ceremony uh, where you drink uh, 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 yak beer and you do sampa smearing flour on your face you can see dave and i the monk uh blesses all of the implements that you may take to the uh, top of the mountain so ice axes crampons and so forth and uh, all those implements are blessed before you head up through the ice fall uh and uh that's the next uh uh, uh project that that's the next challenge is to get through the ice fall safely it's probably the most dangerous part of the trek uh you have to go through it eight to ten times uh the crevasses are uh crossed on these ladders and they would tie these ladders together uh and these this is a little crevasse up in the upper left with a couple of ladders the horizontal ladder segments spanned up to six ladders long and uh, there's vertical ladder segments, and you can see this one tied together five uh, ladders high. So, and these just grew and grew. 
I was too terrified to actually take my uh, camera out in the middle of a big crevasse and take a picture. I was just, I was just too terrified the whole time. So you trek up to camp one, and then you go up to camp two, do your rotation then, and then camp three. This is the camp at the, at the Lotsi face. And you can see it's dug in the side of the hill there. Um, it's at about 24,000 feet. Uh, it's not a very pleasant night. You're jammed in these little tents. And you can see I'm just having kind of a bad hair day. I'm really swollen. And you can just see the wear and tear that, that is on your body. Uh, and there's, you know, Dave, you know, looking at me to kind of, you know, stay clipped into the rope the whole time. And then at night, we would sleep on about a half a liter of oxygen. And that really helped you sort of stay warm, get some sleep and get some rest. And it wasn't a very pleasant night's sleep, but it's, it's something that you had to get through. So you go to camp three and uh, uh, you, you do that. But unfortunately in 2005, it was the worst weather year by far of Everest uh, in, in, in anybody's memory. And the, the, the deal is, is that the jet stream is on Mount Everest and the jet stream is like a giant three-dimensional snake. And usually the monsoon comes up through the Indian Ocean and pushes the jet stream north over time away. That's that weather window that people talk about with Everest. But in our year, the jet stream, or, or sort of the monsoon was late in arriving and the jet stream was some days right on it and some days north of it. So it was entirely unpredictable. So some days there were 20 to 50 knot winds and then there were other days when it was perfectly calm. So what that did was it forced us to have to, to, to hunker down and wait. And that's exactly what we did. And I don't know how many of you in the audience have just spent two weeks doing nothing, uh, but it's very hard for all of us to do, but that's exactly what we had to do. We had read all the books and you know, we played lots of cards and stuff, but it's basically, we just hung out for two weeks waiting for, for weather. So we did a lot of sleeping and here's someone uh, walking the tump line and so forth. And it was a real eye-opening experience. It's the first time I've ever done that where you just got forced downtime and it was, it was an eye-opening experience. So eventually good weather was forecast and we went to the Puja altar again and we go around you know, the altar uh, for blessings and here's Dave. And then we go up the hill and on the right-hand side, we're going past camp one. You can see the summit above us, only, only 9,000 more feet to go. So spend a night at camp, uh, camp two and then camp three. And then from there, you're, you're headed on. At this point, you're in a down suit, which is like wearing a sleeping bag. Uh, and you leave that on the entire time. Uh, this is headed up toward the Geneva Spur. And then you're, on, you're pretty much climbing on oxygen the whole time when you're going uphill. Uh, and it's, it's fun climbing. It's, it's, a, it's a fun day. Uh, but you can tell you know we were sort of in the lead pack, but you could tell there's 40 or 50 of our closest friends behind us, and they all want to summit as well. So uh, we're at camp uh, four here. This is 8,000 meters, and I think Dave and I set the record for the world's highest game of Scrabble. Uh, I, think I, I think I won with a triple word score at some point. It wasn't, I didn't get a lot of points, but uh, I think I, I, I took this one, but yeah, but we were able to um, uh, you know, relax, enjoy ourselves for a few hours. What was interesting, since there's a lot of, you know, medical people in the in the crowd, I thought this is kind of interesting. Where I had a pole ox, and I had it on my finger, and just with you know tent air, uh, my oxygen saturation was 78 percent, which in most places would put you in the ICU, uh, and but your body was acclimatized, uh, and you were uh, ability to function at these low oxygen sats. And then I had an oxygen tank and I started turning it up and I went half a liter, a liter, two liters, three liters. It wasn't until I got to three liters per minute and beyond that the saturations actually bumped up into the, into the high nineties. So there's something about, you know, the oxygen delivery and the uncoupling there that we could talk about at a later time, but it's fascinating that at these low oxygen levels, you don't get any really functional boost at all. It's sort of interesting. So we went to bed about six o'clock that night, got a couple hours of sleep, got up at eight o'clock the same evening. 
and uh, boiled water, had breakfast, and we were out of the tent, ready to uh, ready to climb at, at 10 o'clock that night. We're going to climb through the night, and the plan was to, to summit the next morning. And, um, you know, it's cold, and it's dark, and it's kind of scary. Um, here's our two summit Sherpas that were with us. Uh, uh, Donuru on the left with his eyes closed had summited probably six times before. Mingma Tenzing on the right, this was his first time to the top. Unbelievably strong climbers. And this was sort of our summit team, uh, uh, the, 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 the two Sherpas and Dave and I, and we were, we were in it together. So uh, I'll tell uh, just before that, well, I'll go to the next picture and tell a story the only really mishap I had in the whole uh, uh, experience was that at the balcony at about 27,500 feet, it got windy and it was pitch dark. And I looked up toward Dave and I could tell my eye was, uh, my vision was very blurry. And I said, hey, Dave, you know, my eyes were real blurry. I think I froze my cornea. You, know, you can flash freeze your cornea because it's so cold. And he said, well, you know, that could be an issue. He says, well, I, I brought some clear glasses that I could put over to try to protect my eyes. And I knew I had to watch it because if I, my other cornea flash froze, I would have to turn around. But I also knew that, you know, sort of freezing or, 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 or you know, having a problem with your cornea there, you know, it'll re-epithelialize and it'll come back. It's not a, it's not necessarily a showstopper that you have to turn around, but it's, um, you know, something you really need to be aware of. So about, you know, four in the morning, you know, this, the, the, the sun came up over, um, over, over, the, over the horizon, over Tibet, and uh, I could put goggles on and my eyes warmed up and my vision was okay. So this was 2005. So we were the first group that was heading to the top. We were uh, led by this gentleman in the yellow suit uh, and um, uh, by the name of Willie Benegas. And he's one of the strongest high altitude climbers in the world. And he was setting the ropes, leading us up. And we were literally like two or three people behind him, you know, helping carrying ropes. And we were all going to go to the top together. So off the left hand side, it's about a 7,000 foot drop to Camp Two. On the right-hand side, it's about 9,000 feet down to, to Tibet. So you really need to be careful on this sort of knife edge ridge. Uh, and you know we've all seen these pictures in the magazines, popular press and so forth. So here's a picture in 2009, not too long ago of the crowding. This is you know, toward the Hillary step and the summit. And then everybody knows this picture from a couple of years ago, right? And you know, that's really remarkable. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, that's a crowded day. <laughs> and, you know, the conga line going to the top and it's changed a lot. And on, on a nice day, um, uh, a lot of people want to do the same thing and they have to figure out a way to manage this. So luckily the mountain got a rest in 2020, but we'll see what happens this year. So we'll go back to 2005. So here we are sort of strolling up and Dave is telling me, you know, be careful, uh, you know, watch your step. Uh, and there's Willie, you know, up in front, he's, he's gone past the Hillary step. So here's the Hillary step sort of up close. And there's a bunch of fixed line there and you get to the bottom and you turn your oxygen up to four liters per minute because you need the extra oxygen for the exertion and you have your ascender, which you clip into and you pull on the line and you're sort of, yarding yourself up through the rock and the snow and eventually you're on top and then you take a bunch of deep breaths and then you look up and uh, it's only a you know couple hundred yards to the top and then this is a, a quick pick uh, you know right below the top it's a beautiful day and uh, you know you, you get to this point and you it mean that what was going through my mind is that I, I can't believe it's happening you know this is a sort of a childhood dream and a lot of people think about this and dream about it say so I can't believe it's actually going to happen to me and that everything's working out and it was just a really sort of powerful moving experience and uh, this is at the top the very top is about as big as a ping pong table so there's a bunch of people who have to share the space Dave is from New Mexico so he's got the New Mexico state flag and the prayer flags I'm holding you can see people's names 
written on them uh, that, uh, that I worked with and my family members. So that's what I brought to the top. So I could, I could share the experience with other people. So obviously that was a meaningful experience for me, but uh, you know, what I take away from it is that as I reflect, you know, meaning is everywhere. And we're going to talk about that as the, as the talk goes on, but uh, you know, that's a, it, it, it's, it's one intense, powerful experience, but you get it in a lot of different places in your life. And certainly when I came back from Everest and being, you know, being in Kathmandu for a period of time and in Nepal, you come back and you're full of humility and gratitude and you're very patient and you're very serene and all these things. But how long does it last? I mean, you go into traffic and somebody cuts you off or you're daughter gives you a snarky comment or, you know, the resident puts on three shunt cases overnight when you walk in in the morning and you, so being able to deal with this, you know, this sort of yin and yang, I mean, there's only, you, you can't, it, it, well, I shouldn't say you can't because some po people probably do, but you, you, these types of, uh, of episodes in your life only last so long, unfortunately. And then there's this balance between selflessness, which is what we do on a daily basis in our, in our positions in the medical center versus selfishness. <clears throat> and obviously what I did was extremely selfish in a lot of ways. And I, I totally uh, 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 take responsibility for that. But at the same time, there's a balance between these two things to having a, <clears throat> a healthy life to some extent. And uh, I've thought a lot about that over the years. So Again, I started off the talk to say, why climb? So, well, why do anything? Why swim or ride or hike or cook or dive or read or knit or meditate or pray or whatever? And I think that, you know, George Lay Mallory would say, because it's there, it's something to conquer. You know, my, my way of looking at it is because, because you're here and it's part of the human experience. And I think that's important to remember. And uh, I think that's just sort of in our, in our genetic makeup. And I think it's important to keep all that in mind. So part of this symposium is how to ask, how do we take care of ourselves? And, uh, you know, we all uh, uh, worry about that. And we look at others that have uh, uh, burnout and do they have the balance in life that, that, that you would, that you might want to see and or is it a problem in your own life? Because uh, there's things, there's even things worse than burnout, you know, side effects, and you probably have talked about those earlier, addiction, depression, chronic dishonesty, different types of mental illness, suicide, all these terrible side effects of, of, of burnout and stressful lifestyles. There's been a fair amount written about it in the medical literature, obviously, this is just a short list of some of the papers uh, that have been published in the last few years about burnout and neurosurgery, about having a well-rounded lifestyle, how to combat burnout and all these things. And I think these are all really well-intentioned and they're headed the right direction. Uh, but everybody still needs to, to put them into action. Uh, so here was a paper, a survey of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, membership of the AANS, factors associated with career satisfaction and burnout amongst US neurosurgeons. So about a 56%, 57% burnout rate overall. Interestingly, uh, neurosurgeons in private practice had higher burnout rates than academics. That was interesting. And then with, uh, uh, with the odds ratio, what predicted uh, 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 less of a burnout is a healthy balance between work and, and life outside the hospital. So that's, that's the subject of the, of the discussions today. So you know, I'm sure you've talked about these uh, before in, in, in a more academic point of view, but I, I would say, and you've probably talked about all of these suggested methods to combat burnout. And, you know, some of these are just sort of buzzwords, you know, mentorship and leadership. I think a lot of these are things that you need to sort of take up uh, uh, by yourself and, you know, be a mentor to other people take on leadership roles and accept the responsibility and get the mental challenge and be sort of nurturing and protective toward others. I think that's really important too and have a sense of purpose and community 
and, and, and family with, if, if it's just even your little office or your department, I think it's really important. Keeping physically active to some extent. Wellness is a buzzword, but I think that it's really, that it's really important uh, to keep in mind on a daily basis. So again, I've reflected on this a fair amount. You say, well, God, you know, what did you learn? You know, what did this, what did this trip mean to you ultimately? And I think that the, the three things that I got from it is that, that there has to be some sort of balance in your life that is balanced between selfishness and selflessness. Uh, that's something I constantly struggle with and probably many in the audience do as well for, for the residents and the trainees. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of at all. I think it's part of healthy, healthy life to be able to do these things. Uh, but as long as you're giving toward others and, you, and, you're, and you're able to have that part of you that's available to others, I think that's extremely important. Intention and mindfulness uh, is also extremely important. So when I walk down the hallway to the OR room on Monday mornings, you know, at eight o'clock for the last 25 years, I'm thinking about what are we going to be doing? You know, am I ready? Is my head in the right place? Am I ready for this day? Uh, you know, how can I be the best I can for patients and their families and just being really present to the, to the challenges that are involved and trying to do that in all aspects of your life at home and at work are really important, obviously. And then obviously the big one is just gratitude that I can't, we all, we don't do this in a vacuum and, you know, I could give this Everest talk and beat my chest and do all these things. But at the same time, it was part of a whole group of people that I'm extremely grateful toward and you know I love I love all of them including the people that I work with here in Salt Lake and you know I'm just lucky to be part of a of a larger group of of individuals that uh, that care about me so I'm really really grateful for that and for me that's sort of what's beyond Everest that's what I've gathered uh, over the years and, and I think that that's what I carry with me over time not just you know going to the top of a mountain so I'll leave you with this, well, one more slide after this, this quote from James Minchner that master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his education and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence in whatever he does, leaving others to decide whether he is working or playing. To him, he is always doing both. And I think that's, I think that most people on this it, the the the, uh, the panelists and the people in the audience recognize this and are probably doing this on a on a daily basis, uh, but probably don't realize that you're doing it to some extent. So this was a proud day for me. A few years ago, I was in Israel. I went to the Dead Sea. I was visited the lowest point on Earth. I started a new club, the thirty thousand four hundred and forty foot club, which is the total distance between the top and the bottom of the world. So I thought that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I was really lucky to be there. So anyway, so that's, that's it. That's the rest of my, that's the end of my talk. And I'm happy to answer any questions if uh, people have them. Thanks. Great. Thanks, uh, Doug. Uh, wonderful presentation. We'll take uh, questions for all the panelists uh, in just a sec. I, we, you know, very few of us, um, our mountaineers um, have done something as Doug has just described, but we actually have a mountaineer in our midst. And uh, Dr. John uh, Semple is a plastic surgeon at Women's College Hospital. And he's he's been able to, uh, I think he's been at least to base camp, uh, Doug, maybe beyond. And I've um, he's, he's been to several of the other mountains in, in the Himalayas as well. So, uh, and, and he's been studying at what altitude is, and what it does to your physiology and so on. So J John, did you're, if you're there, do you want to, uh, make a, and he's written uh, quite a bit on this topic. So, John, did you want to mention a few things uh, based on what you heard from Doug? Sure. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, Jim. Uh, Doug, uh, great talk. And uh, interestingly, I was on the north side in 2005, uh, the same time you were on the south side. Uh, I was uh, a doc for uh, a British climbing team and was mm. uh, hanging out on the, the north call. Uh, but uh, yeah, some of our uh, research uh, is more to do with climate change. We've been going back quite a bit to the Himalaya, looking at the influence of uh, um, a lot of the weather patterns uh, and also 
uh, the a lot of the pollution that comes out from Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, interestingly, the the lockdown uh, during the pandemic has actually given us a, a real chance to look at a comparison of, of some of those areas. But uh, I. I uh, I'll just, uh, again, a great talk, uh, Doug, but I, I was interested in some of your comments on, on uh, selflessness and, and selfishness. And I, and I think uh, the, the one thing about mountain climbing I think is important is that in some ways it does uh, satiate some part of, of what your uh, goals and objectives are in life. And I think it, it uh, allows you to have that calmness. And I think, uh, uh, I, I find that uh, one of the things that I, I, I sense in, in you as well is that you've uh, integrated that experience into how you go about your own life. So I think, uh, and I think you do have to be ruthless in a sense as a surgeon to, to uh, grab those opportunities. And I, and I think, because we tend to discount our own sort of lives and, uh, for our patients because the, what we do is, is so demanding. At, uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, but a, a great talk and uh, uh, love to connect on some other things if you're, uh, if you're interested. So thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks for the comments. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll open it up. I, just before that, I want to mention a trip that I took uh, about uh, a year ago where I went to Japan and with a friend hiked around 88 uh, Buddhist temples on this island of Shikoku in um, it was uh, a moving, sort of life-altering experience for me. And it came at a good time uh, in my kind of career in life. And uh, as I was doing it and going from place to place in this very peaceful, remote part of uh, uh, Japan, I just felt everything kind of release. And I felt extremely tranquil and calm and serene. As uh, Doug had mentioned, I got back home, I was a totally new person, and uh, my wife couldn't believe it, Mari, but, um, you know, essentially it lasted about two weeks. <laughs> and then, uh, as Doug, as, just as you said, I mean, we've got to find ways to keep it all going, to keep it uh, together, and, and certainly, I mean, I learned, obviously, a lot more than two weeks worth of, of serenity, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, we, we can definitely balance ourselves and take lessons learned from a variety of different um, uh, things we do uh, outside of the workplace. I think that was the part, the point of, of having this discussion with, with Doug and, and John commenting and so on. So um, with, with just that uh, reflection on, on a trip that I took recently, which was remarkable, and I've, I've got a lecture on this, I can give to you folks uh, later on if you wish. Uh, but uh, maybe we'll open it up, uh, Gi uh, Giuseppe, to the, the panel. I just had one quick question I wanted to ask. Uh, Colin, I guess mostly, and in, in what you've read, Colin, so far, I mean, what what, what are there distinctions in wellness uh, between um, your um, your faculty in medicine versus, let's say, surgeons? Is there much written on this? And and what what do you see as either common themes between the two or differences between the two? Yeah, so definitely, uh, and I can speak for United States data, I, I can't speak, I know the Canadian Medical Association has done nationwide surveys in Canada, I don't know the results across disciplines. Uh, Chris Simon has been part of that work uh, with the CMA. Um, but in the United States, certainly that's been part of our national surveys here. Uh, and the highest burnout areas, it's a bit of a mix across medical and surgical disciplines. Uh, and it really boils down to those drivers that I spoke to and the areas that uh, struggle with those drivers have higher burnout levels. In the United States, it might not translate to other countries. In the United States, the highest burnout areas have tended to be uh, the clinical specialties that are on the front lines of our medical care. So emergency medicine, primary care, uh, interestingly, neurology, because in the United States, uh, neurologists provide a lot of uh, pseudo primary elder care involving dementia and the like. Um, so some of those kinds of disciplines, the surgical areas in the United States have been a little bit more towards uh, kind of average to slightly higher than average burnout. Um, Neurosurgery is an interesting one in the United States in particular because the burnout rate is, is fairly average or slightly above average. 
Um, but the satisfaction with work-life balance is rock bottom. Uh, and it's not even close. Um, and the intensity and the demands, and, you know, and boy, they prepare you guys for that during, uh, and gals for that during training, don't they? Because the, the residency demands are, are uh, you know, just unparalleled. Um, so it, it, it really varies. And in the United States, at least from 2011 to 2014, the single specialty with the largest decline in well being or increase in burnout in the United States, at least, was urology of all things. Mm. And I had no insight into that whatsoever, but I gave a talk for the American Urologic Association. Uh, and they, it was no surprise to any of them. And, and this is where also keeping your eyes open or ears open to what the groups that are immersed in it can tell you. What they said was that in the United States, at least, in large, uh, in their opinion anyway, uh, largely related to reimbursement practices, which is also to the point that was made about private practice having higher burnout than academic. That's been true in the United States in every study we've ever done. And mostly it gets attributed to in private practice, the treadmill never stops. You and, and physicians are not good at putting a stop on their daily workload. It's, oh, well, I'm, I'm leaving revenue on the table or my practice, my private practice group is telling you, look, the revenue's there. How can you not do that case or see that patient? Um, there's no boundary around it. But what the urologist said was uh, they had largely, uh, and this will sound paradoxical for surgeons uh, in our view of, of, uh, of things, but they had been shifted almost entirely into the operating and all of the other aspects of their urological practice around things that didn't require operative intervention, conversations about uh, prostatism, erectile dysfunction, things like that, they didn't have those anymore because they were being handled by NPs and PAs who cost less. And they could be trained and they could develop expertise to, to do this. And so it was considered a good business model but the urologists desperately missed the relationship. And that was the part of their practice where the relationship could develop. And they felt like they had basically been narrowed in their niche to become uh, procedural technical experts, not physicians in the fuller sense of our professional ideal. Great, thanks Colin. And Giuseppe, you have some data about vascular surgeons and vascular surgery across Canada, I think, and the United States. I mean, you're especially has not been all that great either. No, I think that uh, some of the things that struck us when we, we started this at the Arla uh, uh, department level is the low satisfaction rates and, and disappointment with quality of life in vascular surgery in the US. And so um, we're writing this up and we surveyed the Canadian Society for Vascular Surgery and the numbers were pretty parallel. The issues around work-life balance that came through um, and 60%, interestingly, 60% uh, were identifying themselves as academics, which it, we're a small group in Canada, so that makes sense. And, uh, and, but the, um, the issues that came up that I thought were a bit surprising were around bullying, uh, around autonomy, uh, around or lack of autonomy around uh, and then specifically repeatedly where the person that you were supposed to go to for help was also the person that was in charge of your income and scheduling, right? And so in, in a small group, that's not going to be too surprising uh, where the person in charge may be the problem and there are not many other options. Uh, so, uh, so that'll be a bit enlightening uh, in terms of uh, discovering that. And it'll be interesting once we look at our Department of Surgery data, because we have those data uh, by division what they come out to show in, in, the, um, in, in the granular uh, work groups. Okay. Thanks, Giuseppe. Um, Julie, do you, wanna, do you have any comments about uh, what you've seen so far as you've kind of scanned uh, the Faculty of Medicine? I'd be, I'd be interested to know if, um, if you found you know, some groups that are kind of really struggling or having a hard time or either organizing themselves in this mm -hmm. space or uh, groups that um, are, are doing relatively well. Um, do you have the granular, any granular data at this point to talk about that? 
Yeah, I think I do. So yeah, the, the, I would say the, the larger clinical groups are, so, you know, I, I, I met with all the chairs of basic science rehab um, and the clinical chairs. And I think the hardest part for the clinical chairs is obviously that we're so distributed, right? And so a lot of the granular unit level stuff is a lot of the chairs felt a lot of that is out of their hands, right? Because it's, you know, at the site. So that's why I think we have to not just work with departments, but work very closely with the hospitals and the chiefs at the hospitals to actually achieve some on the ground stuff. Um, the other thing that I thought was really important to note is that um, people have difficulty uh, and this is nobody's fault. I just think it's where we are in um, understanding all the literature in, in operationalizing the concept of wellness in the university and in the hospital. So they'll, everyone is very keen to have wellness leads. They're not quite sure what those leads should do. Uh, and I think this is so Colin, your, your, the talk was really quite helpful, I think. And, you know, it makes me think this is why we've sort of targeted some of our resources to helping leaders, right. To really bring some of this stuff, like it's, it's all stuff that we can learn. Leaders can learn. And we know if leaders learn it, they can, it, it makes a direct difference on the people that work under them, so to speak. So, um, so hopefully in the, you know, in the work we're going to do, it will be to actually help people understand, like, what does this look like? What does this look like in my department? What does it look like, you know, in my discussions with my faculty? So those were two themes. The third theme, I think, is people are very um, nervous with, especially with COVID, about what to do if faculty aren't doing well. And how do I, you know, how do I help someone in my faculty if they're not doing well? And what's the right thing to do? Uh, and so we're hoping to provide some direction and support around that. Yeah, as, as mentioned at the beginning, the pand pandemic has really uh, created wrinkles for all of us to try to uh, smooth out or to deal with. It's been really hard and mm -hmm. and hopeful. And, and I know that you're writing some pieces now about um, that in particular, Julie, and, mm -hmm. and uh, with um, sort of mental mental health issues. So uh, we look forward to seeing some of those and uh, maybe since the time is just about finished uh, i know giuseppe if you have something else i just want to ask doug doug if you look in retrospect and looking back on things would you do it again i mean was it something <laughs> that you you mean now as you've had time to reflect on everything um was was it everything you had expected it to be or were there some issues um and uh, what i mean after everest what other mountain is there to climb <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was totally worth it. You know, every, you know, we had lots of ups, we had lots of downs, uh, lots of challenges, but, and I'd do it again in a heartbeat, but I, I would really have, on the other hand, I'd have a second thoughts, you know, just there's so many people, there's a lot of people who just don't belong there. And, you know, I had spent a lot of time in the mountains in my life, and I felt very comfortable what was going on, but there's a lot of people who put others at risk. And, and I think I really, I kind of have a hard time with that. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, if you could, if they could all jump off the mountain and ever leave it for everybody else, that's great, but it doesn't work that way. So everybody's, you know, got their own way of doing things. But uh, I, I think that, yeah, these really intense, big experiences like yours in Japan or, you know, you know, John's on the North side are, they're really profound. Right. And you want to, I mean, you'd go back to Japan next week, probably if you could. Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, th thanks, Doug. And thanks to all speakers. Giuseppe, can I just bounce it back, back to you for closing comments and then want to thank uh, everyone for attending uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. I, 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 you, I was going to bounce back to you for closing <laughs> comments, but thank you for the privilege. First of all, thank you uh, for our panel and our speakers uh, for connecting. We uh, hope to do this going forward and stay connected with our panelists as we accumulate them. I think we have some momentum uh, going and then I think we can learn from one another. Thanks for everybody ta for taking the time to join. And uh, it is a crazy time. And I think there have been some tremendous lessons from a unit level, from a system level, and from a personal level that we've heard today that we can all learn from and connect with. Uh, so uh, stay safe, everyone. And uh, my, my new mantra is be kind. Uh, my wife pointed out to me that uh, we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. 
And some people have yachts and some people have canoes and some people are just drowning. So look to your left and right and help each other out and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you.